There have been many studies documenting differences between fibromyalgia and other pain states, and even those who don't have pain. These have shown differences in the brain scans, in stress, growth and thyroid hormones, as well as lowered androgens. There are also automatic nervous system changes and decreased concentration of certain important neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. So no longer can anyone claim there are no biochemical or MRI, functional MRI changes that can be seen in fibromyalgia. And it is a fictitious illness. This is incorrect. The tests are complex and primarily available only for research purposes, but the results are in. Fibromyalgia is a real disease or syndrome. So no longer can anyone claim there are no biochemical or MRI, functional MRI changes that can be seen in fibromyalgia. And it is a fictitious illness. This is incorrect. The tests are complex and primarily available only for research purposes, but the results are in. The tests are complex and primarily available only for research purposes. These have shown differences in the brain scans, in stress, growth and thyroid hormones, as well as lowered androgens. In stress, growth and thyroid hormones. In to the quarterfinals. No, no, you're kidding. Hi everyone, Jane here. Um, yes, I'm claiming fair use on this video because I'm going to go over some different clips. Uh, I want to use fair use for criticism and comment, etc., etc. And um, I don't think I ever really would have started this YouTube channel if I didn't find some issue in the whole fibromyalgia realm. Um, I've been railing against some of the red herrings that just don't make sense. Now, this first doctor from the Swedish clinic brings up one point that they can identify certain criteria for fibromyalgia, except it's done in research, namely substance P. And that I would describe as a red herring because no one's getting tested. Uh, in one of my videos, though, um, I was looking over a study, and lo and behold, uh, this substance P, or neurotransmitter, transmitter, goes up when IGF-1 goes down. Now, IGF-1 is downstream from growth hormone production. So substance P in essence becomes a red herring and the, the high substance P that never gets tested is essentially put at the doorstep of the pituitary gland. Um, I have no argument there's different causes of fibromyalgia. Absolutely not. There could be rheumatology for example. But the, uh, if when endocrine comes into the picture, um, it, you know, it falls on its face for people to actually get tested correctly. Now this, um, the Swedish clinic doctor in the very beginning of the video um, is really typical of what you hear on the internet here on YouTube about fibromyalgia, but I just have a question. Who wears frogs on their tie? Unless it's casual Friday or if he's a pediatrician also. I mean, this is up on YouTube. Who could take this guy serious, number one? You know, and I, you know, I don't make a habit of poking fun at people, but really? Um, I looked around the Swedish clinic website and I saw no indication these, you know, they're looking at all kinds of alternative treatments and pain management and that, but I saw no indication 
they were being sent to an endocrinologist and um, Swedish clinic is big in the Seattle area I believe okay and I also look at um, some clips from Dr. Jason Tiedelbaum or Tiedelbaum I'm not sure quite how to pronounce it I apologize now he has all the you know big credentials in uh, the MD world he does a lot you know it looks like a lot of speaking on fibromyalgia he has a YouTube channel addressing chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and um, he really lays a lot of blame on fibromyalgia the endocrine side of things on the hypothalamus and I am going to say that's a red herring now you'll just have to take my word for it at this time but when I had my work up when I you, I had my doctor discover I had hypopituitarism and I'm low on growth hormone I asked him why aren't you testing my hypothalamus hormones and he said well because they're not treated your pituitary hormones is what's treated so they don't even have to go down that way um, the way Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum goes uh, one thing, another thing I want to point out is Dr. Teitelbaum sells herbal remedies on his website. Curcumin, for example, 60 count for $31.16. Um, he has a number of things he sells on his website. Now, I don't care if people sell things, but it also, you know, be careful people buyer beware okay next we will um, look over you know some of the things that Dr. Teitelbaum says and I want to point out besides the hypothalamus being a red herring he never urges anybody to go to an endocrinologist to get their pituitary horms, hormones tested that is upstream from like your adrenals in your thyroid etc I mean the pituitary could be the root problem there could be other things but he never urges anyone to get their growth hormone or um, dynamic testing of their adrenal function things like that so okay let's listen in dozens maybe hundreds of infections that can blow a fuse Hormonal deficiencies, any of a number of hormonal deficiencies. Um, food sensitivities, uh, toxins, toxic chemical exposures, toxic boss exposures, toxic spouse exposures, all kinds of ways to blow a fuse here. Um, stress, poor sleep, anything that disrupts sleep. So basically, this is an energy crisis where people have blown a fuse. So people come in, they say, Doc, I hurt all over. I'm exhausted. You ask me one question, which is, can I get a good night's sleep? Hint, hint, okay. Um, you say, hey, you blew a fuse, and you want to figure out how they blew the fuse, what caused them to trip a circuit breaker. One simple question really helps separate out the groups nicely. When did this illness start? Or you can ask them, did it start suddenly or gradually? If people say, well, you know, I've been sick for about five, eight years, but felt kind of lousy for eight or ten years, gradual onset. Uh, gradual onset, you want to think about hormonal problems like low thyroid, perimenopause, um, candida infections, classic, probably most important single infection, uh, autoimmune diseases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, all of these will trigger very frequently a secondary fibromyalgia. And what happens is that the rheumatologist doesn't recognize the fibros there. So they keep whacking them with prednisone and um, chemo agents and really heavy duty medications trying to knock out the inflammation when the problem is not the inflammation, it's secondary fibro. Uh, gradual onset, you want to think about hormonal problems like low thyroid, perimenopause. Um, so anyway, so people basically have blown a fuse. 
uh, called the hypothalamus, um, and to turn the circuit breaker back on and restore function, and this will be on the test, maybe, five key things you need to remember. If you take home one thing from this talk, remember the word shine. This is the recipe for getting people better on a physical level. S stands for sleep, H is hormonal support, I is infections, N is nutritional support and detox, and E is exercise as able. So anyway, so people basically have blown a fuse uh, called the hypothalamus. With the side pocket here. Pituitary hormones, what's the big deal? Pituitary disorders are common, but experts in treating them are not. Small changes in replacement may make a big improvement in symptoms. Many endocrinologists do not understand how to properly replace patients with hypopituitarism and do not understand or don't believe in monitoring hormone levels. We simply see the need to do more. Need. Now let's take a look at hormones. Uh, hormones are our body's communication and control system. So uh, the entire hormonal system virtually is controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, ovarian, testicular axis. So we're going to see that these, you're going to see widespread hormonal deficiencies. Um, again, as you know, thyroid is like the body's gas pedal, adrenal is a stress handler, uh, the reproductive hormones. What's critical to know is that even mild hormone deficiencies can cause widespread and severe problems. So the hypothalamus pituitary, so the hypothalamus pituitary. Instead, Dr. Friedman suspected pituitary disease, especially considering her periods were irregular. He performed a TRH test, which showed a blunted response. Three consistent with pituitary disease. Her IGF-1, marker of growth hormone secretion, was quite low at 89 ng slash ml and she had an abnormal response to growth hormone dynamic testing. Doctor 13? Oh, wow, I did. Just, it can be after a parasite or even other infections, after an injury and after pregnancy. People do fine during pregnancy. It's after the baby is born. It's like pulling the hormonal carpet out from under them and they crash and burn. Oh, wow. After an injury and after pregnancy. People do fine during pregnancy. It's after the baby is born. It's like pulling the hormonal carpet out from under them. Traumatic brain injury has come uh, into light recently uh, due to media coverage for sport injuries, for combat um, coming back from wars and having uh, some um, uh, hormonal deficiencies, the pituitary, then definitely they can have high risk of having pituitary damage. But the more recent light that's shedding on this case is with more blunt trauma uh, that can cause disturbance in the pituitary function without causing fracture in the skull base. And hypopituitarism, um, obviously, it's the, the harder the trauma, the more severe the trauma, then the chances of having some pituitary function damage are higher than if there is a mild or moderate trauma. After an injury and after pregnancy, people do fine during pregnancy. It's after the baby is born. It's like pulling the hormonal carpet out from under them. And um, the pituitary gland itself have a special uh, sensitivity to be damaged during labor and postpartum for uh, this is a cartoon that shows it during labor, well first, during pregnancy, the pituitary gland itself is actually larger than when a, when a person is not pregnant because of all the hormonal, increased hormonal demand during pregnancy. Now combining an enlarged pituitary gland already with a, a bleed and low blood pressure and during pregnancy and delivery time, there is some problems with clotting, the bleeding, and there are issues with blood flow. 
So combining all these factors during labor and after labor with decreased blood supply, problem with clotting, and an already enlarged pituitary gland that needed increased demand of blood, that relative decrease in blood supply to the pituitary gland can lead to what we call infarct means there's necrosis, there's death in the pituitary gland, and that can affect uh, a lot of the pituitary function. Now, how can you usually present? It depends, again, the same rules, which hormones are affected and how fast it's get affected and this degree of the pituitary damage. So in severe cases, uh, the woman can present with feeling very tired, lethargic, unable to breastfeed her baby, and can present within a few weeks. In moderate cases, again, after delivery, the woman will still feel tired, fatigued, start to lose weight weight, start to lose some of the sexual hair and decrease sexual function. In very mild cases, this can go on for years and it's not uh, picked up. Um, can it can just be very vague, tiredness, uh, aging and premature aging, just not feeling well uh, overall. And there was some uh, a study from Turkey that shows the median age for the diagnosis to be accurately done. It took almost 26 years, which is scary and you think how many cases are missed. He called it where? He got me. He called it into the, yeah, there, in the corner. Come on. He's trying to make this ball for it. It has to go in between all of the balls. That's a chance. Wow, what a shot. Oh, my God. Oh. A study from Turkey that shows the median age for the diagnosis to be accurately done. It took almost 26 years, which is scary. And you think how many cases are missed. feels the best of the person, then check the free T4 to make sure it's in the normal range for safety. With hypothalamic dysfunction, TSH is simply not reliable. Weight gain. We mentioned average weight gain in this disease, 32 and a half pounds from the metabolic problems. So you tell people, look, once you get the metabolism working, we optimize thyroid, adrenal, acetylcarnitine, which makes it possible to lose weight, treating candida. Do you know if you don't get enough sleep, you gain an average six and a half pounds? Because sleep makes growth hormone and leptin. Because sleep makes growth hormone and leptin. I have never seen anything like it before. Now, for the adrenal test, we don't use two standard deviations for the normal range. To be uh, below the normal range, which is under six microgram per deciliter, you have to be in the lowest one out of 100,000. It has to be so low that you have Addison's and it can essentially kill you. Um, natural support for the adrenal gland, glandulars, vitamin C, licorice. There's uh, many, many good products that contain all of these, vitamin B5. Um, so again, bioidentical hormones, you've heard the rest. Now let's take a look at infections, the eye. There are over 100 infections that have been implicated in this disease. There's one that you need to know to treat in everybody with this illness. Treat them for candida. I don't do any tests for the candida. If they have fibromyalgia, I treat them. Uh, feels the best of the person, then check the free T4 to make sure it's in the normal range for safety. With hypothalamic dysfunction, TSH is simply not reliable. Secondly, I'm concerned that you may have adrenal insufficiency Addison's disease. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is an autoimmune disease and patients with one autoimmune disease often develop another. In this case, it could be Addison's disease. Patients with adrenal insufficiency can have severe fatigue, weight loss, excess skin pigmentation and salt craving. They often have low blood pressure when they stand. This is due to a deficiency of the adrenal mineralocorticoid hormone, aldosterone. This may give them their fatigue. Your endocrinologist may want to measure hormones such as cortisol, ACTH, T's, renin, and aldosterone. You may be treated with replacement hormones including hydrocortisone, fluorine F, and DHEA. The one in the side. Very tough shot, but he's got a, but he, he does have a shot.
um, yesterday, and I get to go see an endocrine, endocrine, endocrinologist. Um, yeah, and then everything else continues tomorrow, so um, my schedule is kind of constantly changing and we're fitting in the things that the doctors recommend for me to do. We just got back from the intracon I can never say the word, intracrinology appointment. <laughs> and it was interesting, it wasn't super helpful, but um, we did get to learn about some of uh, my blood test results. Yeah, most of it came back pretty normal, which is good. You know, somewhat annoying because I want answers, but you know, it's good. There's a recap the week and kind of tell you guys where we landed when it came to my health stuff and what my next steps are. So you kind of saw a little bit in the video, but there were lots of different testing and things that I did. What was great about all those tests is that we were eliminating all kinds of things that could be really, really dangerous. So we know those aren't the issues so we can figure out what is the underlying condition. So by our last appointment, we sat down with the doctor and he officially diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome. Surprise, <laughs> that's what I've been saying. I've been saying for a while that I essentially have chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as myalgic encephalomyelitis, ME, or systemic exertion intolerance disease, it's SEID, it has all kinds of names. But the second diagnosis they gave me, I've really, I've really questioned, and there's been times where I was certain that I did have this, and other times where I have wavered and then this week I really was like I have to have it um, they officially diagnosed me with fibromyalgia as well changes in diagnostic criteria uh, starting off in 2010-2011 uh, uh, the uh, diagnostic criteria has changed uh, where we uh, no longer are using those 18 tender points uh, but now uh, look at pain in widespread parts of the body uh, and also with other symptoms, such as cognitive symptoms, sleep symptoms, and fatigue symptoms. Uh, and all, uh, all these really do play into the current uh, diagnostic criteria for this. So there's no sort of blood test or an x-ray or a bone scan, for example? Uh, there is not. Uh, one of the other uh, key uh, developments uh, within the new, uh, most recent criteria in 2016 is it's no longer a diagnosis of exclusion. That's what I was going to ask next. Is it just because it's not anything else and that's how you finally get to, and so it must be fibromyalgia? <laughs> absolutely not. So, so it's one of these uh, conditions where you can absolutely have fibromyalgia plus lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or any other condition that causes pain. Uh, what uh, is behind fibromyalgia is the amplification of these normal pain signals. And so often what we uh, think about with this is uh, if you have one of these other conditions and the pain that you're experiencing is something where it's much more than you would expect based on the degree of a uh, pathology. Uh, so if you have arthritis and there's uh, not uh, very severe inflammation or joint destruction, this could be something where your pain is being amplified and fibromyalgia should be something that you should think about as a reason for that. So apart from living with the pain, if you ignore it, is there any complications or anything bad that can happen to you? No. Okay. You're just in pain all the time, which is kind of affects your quality of life. I mean, sure I'm not does. a doctor. Yeah, no, no, it would do. <laughs> and so, so it really depends on it, if the cause of that pain is something that otherwise needs to be treated to prevent other bad things from happening, then of course uh, that should be looked into. But uh, what a lot of we spend when it comes to treatment for this is to get the mind uh, not focusing on the pain as much, but more focus on uh, what you're able to, to do and imp to improve function. Uh, function. Um, Dr. Kakar had asked about if there was a blood test, and that would certainly make things easier if yeah. you could do a blood test to find it. Absolutely would. But uh, you. That was Mindy Meehan, and she's a precious young lady who's been struggling with fibromyalgia and has tried numerous alternative treatments without success, as far as I know, up to date. Um, but she went to the Mayo Clinic and did get a di diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And I was very happy to see she saw an endocrinologist. Um, I don't know what, I, I would really love to know what they tested her for. For example, did they test her IGF-1 to see how her growth hormone might be doing? Uh, I'm curious to know if they did any dynamic testing like for her adrenal glands. Um, and then I am, the next clip is of Mayo Clinic Radio 
and a doctor talking about fibromyalgia and um, and that they rule things out and that's good to see. I'm going to, you know, at this stage of the game, give a benefit of the doubt that they're doing a thorough endocrine workup. Um, but on their website, they show that they want to exclude a rheuma, rheumatic disease, mental health disease, neurological disorders. And some of the blood tests are complete blood count. They're probably looking for anemia. Um, the said rate is looking for a rheumatology condition. Thyroid and vitamin D are both in the endocrine ballpark. So, but there's, you know, it doesn't look all that thorough, although it might be different with boots on the ground if you're there. And they mentioned another one, cyclic citron. I can't say it, that third one the peptide, and I did look it up, I've never heard of it, um, and that is looking for a rheumatological condition related to uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I believe. And I also looked on the Mayo website, and I looked up hypopituitarism, and you know, they do treat it. Uh, uh, steroids, um, they treat the thyroid, sex hormones, growth hormone, yay, I see growth hormone up there, and fertility hormones. And this is um, in relation to adults, which is very good to see. Um, but the next clip, understanding the pituitary gland with Dr. William Young kind of blew my socks off and it makes me very sad to put it up but you know I mean it they say they treat hypopituitarism but wait till what wait till you hear what he has to say it was crushing and they might treat hypopet in regard to say somebody has their pituitary removed or loses all function from surgery, that type thing. Um, and it makes me very sad. It's a little bit of a story time. Um, I had trouble getting diagnosed with Cushing's in 2012 and uh, went out of network to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona in 2013 and got diagnosed and had surgery. It was the whole thing was expensive to go out of network, but I had a really, really great endocrinologist. Um, he was a very good clinician. I was just not your typical case. By then I was very emaciated, although I showed him pic my fat pictures. Um, and it wasn't very overt Cushing's, the numbers weren't off the charts. They call it mild. And I absolutely hated that word mild Cushing's because it was, I was so sick. There was nothing mild about that. And because it was subclinical and probably cyclic, which is really rare for an adrenal Cushing's, my endocrinologist told me he had discussed, quote, my case with an endocrinologist in Rochester. And this Dr. Young is from Rochester and he is very up to, um, up to par on adrenal Cushing's. So my endocrinologist may have discussed my case with this doctor. So it makes it extra crushing that he could not acknowledge adult growth hormone deficiency. Um, easy to say at a doctor's desk, but when your boots on the ground suffering from it, you know it could kill you. Okay, so I don't, it makes me sad to bring it up at all, but there you have it.
than a child to in children the one additional thing it does in in the child is it's responsible for growth oh. so the pituitary makes growth sure. hormone um, once uh, you reach full adult, adult height um, it's debatable whether you actually need growth hormone anymore as an adult so um, once uh, you reach full adult, adult height um, it's debatable whether you actually need growth hormone anymore as an adult so um, once uh, you reach full adult, adult height um, it's debatable whether you actually need growth hormone anymore as an adult. So this is the shot right here. Can he hold it together for this? No. <laughs> Missed it by a mile. Missed it by a mile. Q, I know children can become growth hormone deficient. Can adults also become growth hormone deficient and how is it related to chronic fatigue? A adults with growth hormone deficiency have severe fatigue, weight gain especially around the abdomen, are often depressed, and have poor quality of life. Children, but not adults, with growth hormone deficiency are short. Most cases of adult growth hormone deficiency are due to damage to the pituitary, often the result of a tumor, usually not malignant. Symptoms of growth hormone deficiency may be the first manifestation of a pituitary tumor. However, a tumor is not always present even though a patient is truly growth hormone deficient. Growth hormone therapy is effective only for patients who are truly GH deficient. Patients with other causes of CFS will not be helped by growth hormone therapy and some may be harmed by it. It is very important to be correctly diagnosed. You should not take growth hormone unless you are found to be growth hormone deficient. 9. Quetzales. So I should have my growth hormone measured? A. Not exactly. Growth hormone is secreted in pulses so a single measurement of blood levels is not helpful. Rather your endocrinologist will probably screen you by measuring a plasma IGF-1 level. If it is low, your doctor may do sophisticated tests that stimulate growth hormone secretion and measure its levels. These tests should only be performed by personnel experienced with GH testing. Many endocrinologists do not understand how to properly replace patients with hypopituitarism and do not understand or don't believe in monitoring hormone levels. We simply see the need to do more. A pound weight gain over the past two years in spite of dieting and exercise. I'm constantly tired, yet I have trouble sleeping. I'm growing a mustache and have extra hair around my breasts, although I've always been on the hairy side. I've missed three periods this year and when they come they are light. I'm also depressed. What could I have, Doc? A. The endocrine diseases that come to mind are Cushing's syndrome, the metabolic syndrome or adult growth hormone deficiency. Q. What is Cushing's syndrome and why do you mention it in this case? A. Cushing's syndrome, a specific cluster of symptoms, is often due to a tumor of the pituitary, Cushing's disease. This tumor will cause the adrenal glands to make too much cortisol. Weight gain, fatigue, trouble sleeping, irregular periods, extra hair growth, hirsutism, and depression are common symptoms. Cushing's syndrome may be very difficult to diagnose. Patients should be sent to an endocrinologist who may collect urine for cortisol, urinary free cortisol, UFC, and 17 hydroxysteroids or collect nighttime salivary cortisol levels. They kind of look, there's a little bit, you know, fortunate there, but I'm going to tell you what, he was trying a, a lot of piece of that shot. It can be easy at times, and at times it just looks like a, just like a puzzle every time. Wow, look at oh, that. Oh, give that man a round of applause. Wow, look at oh, that. Oh, give that man a round of applause. Oh, my God, that might be the best shot I've ever seen in my life. Just like a puzzle every time. Wow, look at oh, that. Oh, give that man a round of applause. Endocrine causes of fatigue thyroid disease impaired conversion of the thyroid hormone T4 to T3 adult growth hormone deficiency adrenal insufficiency mineralocorticoid insufficiency metabolic syndrome insulin resistance diabetes hypoglycemia vitamin D deficiency Cushing syndrome androgen deficiency estrogen deficiency questions and